Thank you, Russ. That was a wonderful introduction. And um, I want to let you know that I'm not from the Houston area. I, li I live up in um, Dallas, Fort Worth area, from Richardson. And so um, one of the secrets of being a landscape architect is that we have a license that allows us to work all over the state. But the reality is, we are not botanists, we know plants, but we may not know plants from all over the state. So, as I talk to you today, I'm not going to get real specific about specific plants. Your next presentation is going to do that uh, better than I ever could. But one of the things that we do is we look to the region in Texas. I look to the region when I'm doing a project. If I do a project here in Houston, I go to the, the Houston NIPSOT website and, and look up all the lists of what the local plants are and what the local region or plant, native plants are for that region and, and learn as much as you do. So, just to let you know that, that's where I start too. So if you're a beginner and, and um, trying to identify what kind of plants to use, I'm there with you. So um, Today we're going to talk about designing for habitat, techniques for in, inviting wildlife into our landscapes. And what we find with native plants, if you look at native plants for your region, you're going to find, uh, see a sense of place. And it's, it's the native plants that are there, it's how they're put together. This is a prairie, a coastal, um, it's part of the Gulf, probably the Gulf Coast marshes. Um, if we look a uh, little bit north of Houston, you're going to see the southern tertiary uplands, or some of us call it the piney woods, which have more of a forest habitat. But look at, at this. This is not, they both have trees, they both have canopy trees, they're both woodlands, but they're very, very different. What makes them different? and that is the biological regions. We can, we can identify them because of the, uh, if we look at the biological regions of Texas, we can identify what kind of plants are gonna be in that region and that's gonna cause a different look. So what does that have to do with your home landscape? When we design for our landscapes, we're looking for plants that will work in that growing environment. We, and, and a growing environment is soils, moisture, temperature, sun and shade. And then the other thing that we want to do is provide for wildlife habitat. And that is providing food, shelter, and water for, those, for the critters that come to that um, habitat. So if you go to the nursery, you're going to look for plants that have the growing environment. Now I'm going to start with the bottom one here, sun and shade, because this, this is our typical idea of what shade is in our landscape. Morning, we have shade that 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 is like this and then in the evening it gets to be more shade well that's basically true but in here in texas there's more to it in december the sun rises if this is east and west this is north this is east and west in this on this around this house the sun rises 30 degrees south of straight east. So instead of the sun coming up and coming straight across, it comes from the south. It comes up and then down. And that's December, but in the summertime, just the opposite. It moves to the north. 
And so those shade patterns change 60 degrees from, from, e from winter to summer. So sun rises here, come, comes up here, red, sun sets here in December. In the summertime, it rises north of east, sets north of west. How many got that? <laughs> great, great, thank you. Um, because it is a little bit confusing. Our, our shade is not always in the same place. And so if you are selecting a plant that is a early spring plant, you're gonna have a different sun pattern than you would if you have some fall plants. So just keep that in mind. Water needs is something every plant has, we have to consider. What are the water needs of the plants? What are the temperature needs? Now, the nursery trade has long ago developed the system of zone, what they call plant zones. And you will see um, a plant zone and basically it's from south to north and you, they have a range of what they consider um, temperatures that that plant will work in. Well, that's very nice and it's very good, except it's only one, one thing, it's just temperature. We also need to consider soils as well. Now, this is a plant that is not found in Houston. This is a blackfoot daisy. And it is, this is Texas right here. I, it's a little hard for this um, map to be seen, but this is the Texas. And this is, in this bright green, is where the natural habitat is for that blackfoot daisy. Now, if you were thinking about just temperature, you're here in Houston, and here it is found over in Big Bend, this plant, blackfoot daisy, is found over there. So the temperature is similar. We have the same temperatures. But this blackfoot daisy will not grow in Houston if you don't do a lot of amendments. The clay soils that you have here hold the water. What the blackfoot daisy really, really needs is excellent drainage on those roots. And so the first winter, the first, and, and there's a lot more rainfall here than there is out in West Texas. So it's just really, really wet. So we have to consider soils. We, we do consider the temperature. You have to consider the water needs and you have to consider the light factor. So that's what we do when we select plants for our landscape. So that's a lot to put together. If we look at habitats, if we look at the definition of a habitat, a habitat is made up of physical factors such as soil, moisture, range of temperature, and availability of light, as well as the biotic factors such as availability of food and the presence of predators. And so those are the things, same things, that we're wanting to know to plant a plant. So I, in my mind, you can put these two together, and this is what I do in my landscapes, is okay, I've got an ecological region, and I've got an ecological zone that has these kinds of soil, moisture, temperature, and light patterns. If I pick those native plants from that region, from that zone, well then, then I can put that into my yard and just mimic that. So we're going to mimic what is natural to your landscapes and put that into your own yard. Now we're going to talk a lot about how you do that, but you plant for... So we have the, the Gulf Coast 
prairies and marshes. Well, that's a big range. So let's let in our landscapes, in our home landscapes, it's not that big. And so let's break it down a little bit more. We're going to plant for the, the microhabitat conditions in a landscape. We're going to plan for change in our landscapes because our um, uh, landscapes change from the minute you put them in the ground. From the minute I put them on paper, when I design a landscape, I plan on that um, landscape changing. And there are several reasons. When I take a landscape and put it on a plan and take it to my client, that person has some needs of their own. And they, they go, oh, you know, I really love this particular plant and it's not on your plan, can I have that? I mean, that will always happen. It's uh, inevitable. And so I deal with landscapes a whole lot better if I accept, okay, this, is, this landscape is gonna change from the minute I put it on the paper until 10 years later, 20 years later, whatever. And then the other thing, as we heard in the previous presentation, is we need to provide diversity. The best way to, to um, involve all different kinds of um, species to your landscape is to have a diversity of plants. So, local conditions influence that habitat. Now, this particular cross-section is a North Texas cross-section, but I think it works for, to show you, to give you an example. This is Spring Creek Preserve, and here is the area where there is a creek, it's, this is the riparian area, that's the wetland community. If I am trying to just kind of separate the types of microclimates that I might pull plants from and mimic, this is where I'm gonna start. I'm going to think, okay, I, I have a wetland area, um, th this is where I'm going to look for what kind of plants I'm going to put in that area. The woodland area, in this, in this uh, case it's an uh, upland forest and whatever kind of trees are there the, in my region, that's the kind of trees I'm going to use there. I've got a prairie, this is an upland prairie, it's not a coastal prairie, it's an upland prairie. It, it has its own kind of plants. So if we look at that woodland habitat a little closer, keep in mind we're going to mimic this type of, uh, of, of a landscape. We're going to use native mature trees from our region, from your region, it's going to provide a lot of dappled shade, but those canopy trees provide the dappled shade. Underneath, you're going to have understory trees, you're going to have understory shrubs, and you're going to have the forest floor. And this is how you think about what plants to select for that area. I started with the woodland because in our urban landscapes, most of us want some shade because that's where we live as well. And, um, and so most of us have some kind of canopy tree in our landscape if, or we bought the property because it had these beautiful trees. Um, and that usually happens in the backyard more often than the front yard, but it can happen in both. But from there when we when we use that form 
we would put some understory trees in, we put our understory shrubs in, we figure out what we're going to put on that forest floor, and it may be just mulch. Prairie habitat, what does it look like? It's mostly sun for the most part. Now, some of the plants that you find in a prairie are, you'll see that they are uh, identified as, as part sun plants. And you go, well, there aren't any trees out there. Well, of course a prairie's got a riparian area nearby, so that's um, the shade, shade. But as well, is the tall prairie grasses will shade some of the smaller forbs that are underneath. You have some, some forbs or flowering perennials that are going to be tall and take in that sun, but you have some that are going to be small and underneath those uh, prairies. So that's where you get that part shade kind of thing. And um, Coastal characteristics are that you have more moisture than the upland prairies. And um, even though the, the coastal prairie area and the North Texas blackland prairie has the big four, little blue stem, big blue stem, switchgrass and Indian grass, you will have more of the yeah, switch grass here because you have more moisture than we do up there and, and the other wetland species as well. So, but that is the difference. But he, and then um, the wetland habitat, the big key to it is you have more moisture and, and those plants that you'll find that you're looking for there either are, are plants that live in water or they're um, plants that can take that periodic flooding. And in addition, most of those plants are also good erosion control. So if you have an erosion problem, that, that would be where you would look to find some plants for that. As I said, our landscapes change. Well, that isn't, you know, even our larger ecoregions change. Um, we've all heard of, of a forest succession where plants start, if, if they have, there's a disturbed area, you start with short annual plantings, and then some shrubs come in, and then a young, and in with those shrubs is some fast growing trees, and then the young forest comes in, and then young forest is some of the um, more um, climax, what we call climax trees. In our, in Texas, a lot of them are oaks, uh, pecans, um, that kind of trees will come in, and then you, they grow older, and you have a mature forest, and those initial um, uh, trees that were the fast growing ones have died at that point. They have those fast growing trees only have a lifetime of usually around 50 years or something like that. They die out, but at that point you have the mature trees. Now what does that have to do with your home landscape? It, probably not a lot except the idea that your landscape is going to change. Um, but some designers have uh, used that to their advantage. Raw dirt, sand that had bulldozers in there and stuff like that. It will have fallow for a little while, but the, the, the early successional trees started to move in, the cottonwoods. And the, the, in that area, it's hackberries. They are faster growing, and they were growing all around that, that um, pond, uh, the sand pit area, which now was a pond. So they went ahead and left those trees, let them provide the shade for the understory, for the forest floor, and then 
they planted oaks, let them have the time that they needed to grow, but in the meantime, they could go ahead and put in the shade plants underneath so that they would plan for the, the um, a long-term shade that they were gonna have. But that is one way you can use it in landscape. But most of all, just know that your, your landscape is gonna change. And if you can anticipate how it's gonna change a little bit, that's helpful. If not, just flow with it, let it go. Um, for one thing, plants grow. These are, these are little plants that just started and they grew in to be, I mean, this is um, a one gallon plant planted. This is three years later and that's fall aster, um, just grew. But, but another thing happened in this example is there was a mature tree, but it got oak wilt and it died. And so the environment is totally different now. They did plant another little tree in there, but that landscape is gonna change and you're gonna have some different changes happening. And in addition, you're just gonna have plain seasonal change. Um, this is at the um, LBJ uh, Wildfire Center. There's the bench right back there. There it is in wintertime. This is fall. It's got the Lindheimer muley growing there. But it is much different in the wintertime than it is in the summertime. I mean, than it is in the fall. The previous presentation, um, Bob told us about diversity in the ponds and that is the way that I do a lot of my plantings in in uh, landscape for all kinds of habitat is just create a lot of diversity a diversity in heights of plants give it you know have those ornamental trees have those ground covers have an area of mulch all of those things create, give a different habitat for a different species, animal species. If you are, if you are wanting to bring a specific type of um, uh, critter to your yard, we'll research that and find out what it needs and, and then go ahead and put that into your landscape. But if you just want to have lots of life in your landscape, just make sure you have a lot of diversity. And, and a diversity provides um, food for um, all different kinds of, of um, you know, if you have a, a nectar-loving um, bird or butterfly, then, if that only blooms two weeks, what is that, what is that species gonna use other times? So if you have a diversity of different kinds of things, you're gonna have a diversity of different foods. And make sure that you have a diversity in form as well. Have some of those spiky yuccas in there and, and softer um, grass-like plants as well as your perennials. So now we're gonna look specifically at woodland gardens and how that works in your home landscape. So in the landscape design, we're gonna mimic the regional woodlands using our regional native plants. Start with canopy trees, put in some understory trees, understory shrubs, some ground covers, and you may have some mulch areas. I mean, forest floor has mulch areas. Don't worry about that every, every spot has to be covered with plants, it doesn't. One of the things that is, well, I'm gonna, 
This is a side yard, the same side yard, and this is the same landscape actually. Side yards are particularly interesting and if you're trying to do wildlife habitats, um, because they're so narrow, this one is actually a wide one. It's got nine feet, eight feet, nine feet. Um, the other thing about it is, whoops, let me go back. There we are. This is a two-story house. Uh, there is an eight-foot fence right there. On the other side of this eight-foot fence is another six or eight feet and another two-story house. That's what we deal with in our urban areas. And this is just a reality. We, and it's, in some ways it's a good thing. We use the, the land uh, more efficiently that way, but it makes, for making habitat in your landscapes, it makes it a little more difficult because in that area, there's two things that seem to happen. One is that if you've got two two-story houses, you've got a lot of shade. You've got shade that is not, and then the other thing is, if there's any irrigation, well, if there is or isn't irrigation, it's always wet in that area. Um, one is because the, all the water drains off the roof, goes into that area, it's supposed to go out somewhere, but usually it kind of sits in that area and, and becomes wet. So you ha it's, an, it's an interesting um, kind of a problem. And the shade that you get from those two houses is not the same as a tree canopy shade. Tree canopies have dappled, what we call dappled light. And that means that sun is able to come through those leaves and, and little spots of sun end up on the ground. But when you have a building, there is no, no little spots of sun that reaches the ground. And so this is one of the issues that we just, if you're planting a, a habitat landscape that is, you, could, you can plan that area as a woodland because you have the shade, but you have to really think in terms of deep shade. What are plants that will handle that really deep shade because of, it's just different. Now like this corner in this landscape, it is, West is actually that direction, so it gets no west shun, gets no um, east sun, it gets very little east sun. I mean, it just gets very little sun, so you have to be really diligent to look for those plants that will handle that really, really deep shade. And, and believe me, the temptation is to go for those non-natives that are really, um, uh, that will handle that deep, deep shade because you, you know, want to find something to live. But if you can hang in there and look for things, um, inland sea oats is always my to-go to uh, uh, plant for that area because it's just aggressive enough. And, and usually what I do, and I, work in those areas, I go for a plant that's a little more aggressive than I want it uh, if it was out in a, in a dappled shade situation because it needs to really be vibrant and be able to grow. This is um, Missouri Violet and this is Turk's Cap. Now that Turk's Cap is, isn't exactly really happy back there so um, it's not getting quite enough sun. Um, Turk's cap is, is an interesting plant that it, uh, it's one of my um, to-go-to plants because it grows in the sun, grows in the shade, looks great in either one. I usually um, only put it in the shade, I rarely put it in the sun just simply because 
Um, there are so many other plants that I can put in the sun, and I, this one will work in the shade. But that deep corner, uh, it, it may, we may, it isn't really going to work there. The other thing about woodland is look for the woodland edge plants as your and the way to way to look at these things go out in nature go out to the Katy Prairie go out to these areas and and observe um, this is an edge open area na natural open area here's the edge red buds that's what I found um, I mean, as an edge plant. Frostweed is an edge plant. Ironweed is an edge plant. But these are just another specialty situation that you're going to find and you look for. So if you are you're, um, have a situation, go out in nature, look and see what's growing there. Now we're going to move to the prairie and how that might manifest itself in your landscape, a prairie habitat. One thing about prairies is that because we have the sun, we're, we're thinking sun areas, there's lots of opportunities for blooming perennials. And um, there's lots of opportunity for low water use plantings because these have those deep roots. Um, and this is where our, most of our specialty habitat gardens are located, like butterfly gardens. And one that's very popular right now is the Monarch Way Station Gardens, um, Hummingbird Gardens. Um, there are more than that, but we start with the idea that we're going to have grasses and forbs or blooming perennials. Here, this, this is a, a, a photo and a design uh, found at Plano Blue Stem blog spot. This is not my design, but I just think it is a gorgeous example of what you can do with the perennial garden of um, a prairie garden situation in a landscape. Now, they haven't used, they've used more perennials or forbs, more of the flowering perennials than you would find in a regular prairie. They've limited the amount of grasses to a few. Um, this is just kind of uh, how we, not every landscape, is, particularly in urban areas, can be a pocket prairie. We get a little bit of this. And um, I think that's just a reality, and we'll talk about why that is in a little bit. Here's one without as much color, um, but we, it is another area of a prairie habitat garden. Here's an example of some butterfly gardens. Um, and as I said, the monarch gardens, um, if you are wanting a specific species to come to your landscape, you need to research, you need to know what that species needs. Now the monarch gardens, of course, you need milkweed for them to lay their larvae on, their eggs on in the springtime. If you don't have milkweed, they won't lay their eggs there and you're going to have fewer, fewer uh, monarchs. You may have, if you, even if you have blooming perennials, you may have a few of the monarchs that come through in the fall and they're just after nectar. They aren't laying eggs at that time. And so they may come through your yard and if you have some frostweed or some mist flower or something, they'll come in and... Um, uh, get some food on their way south, but but they won't stop there in the springtime. They didn't see any milkweed. They're going to go. Not stopping there. We need we need uh, milkweed to 
lay our eggs on. And we all know that the monarch that comes south in the winter is the same monarch that goes north in the spring and they make it just to about this area. They may, it may be to lay those eggs. That is the fifth generation of monarch. We all, uh, the monarchs, the first generation, second generation, third generation, fourth generation only last, live about a month as they go north. It's the fifth generation that comes back south and goes to Mexico to overwinter, comes back north. So that fifth generation is the, the one that lives a long time uh, in a, a butterfly lifetime. In a prairie garden, there are um, some microclimates that we just want to talk about so that you can look for. Um, a curb, when you have a slope that comes down, the curb right here, water, and when you have a rainfall event, water comes and sheets off it, it's gonna overflow into the, the street, but moisture has a tendency to catch right there at the curb. And that's a specific microclimate. And so, um, Think about that and look for that in the landscape. The wetland habitat um, is designed to absorb and filter runoff, and the rain we um, and we can do that in our home landscapes. Also, we can have um, ponds, which we learned about, or little fountains that have less evaporation. Um, bioswales, and what does a rain garden look like in your landscape? This one was just built. Water comes out of the gutter. You got a mound of gravel where that water goes to. The water is filtered, and there's a little berm all the way around here. So then the water sits there and percolates down into your soil. And here it is after planting. That is kind of before midway through planting. There are other urban microclimates. Um, north cold winds, we don't worry about that too much if we're planting native plants, but we may be interested in ventilating our southern breezes through our landscape. If you can have that, that breeze in the middle of summer, you may be able to sit out in your patio. In our landscapes, we have to incorporate our needs into um, our landscapes. So we have to follow laws, we have to you know, have our own desires, and then um, working with the public. These signs are great. Um, the laws governing landscapes, the ones that catch, we have homeowner association rules that we have to deal with. And then we have what we call weed ordinances. And that's the ones that catch us a lot of times in our native plants. And what are the strategies that we have that we can use to um, work with that? Know your native plants. Don't just let everything grow out there. Know what you have. Label them if you need to. If you're talking to a code enforcement person and you can say, well, that's frog fruit, uh, there, that's gonna go a long way for knowing that landscape or that's this kind of grass. Um, know that you have to do some maintenance. There's a reason for um, not having plants fall over into the sidewalk and that's so that the public can use that sidewalk. Um, and then use aesthetics to, to um, make it. People, the people's objections to native landscapes is that they think it looks messy. If we can use design elements to, um, 
to give that a sense of order, give that wildscape a sense of order, well then that is uh, an effective way of making people like our wildscapes. I'm going to skip this slide. Um, just know that we have owners' needs and desires and we have to have what we need. Um, if you have a dog, if you have kids, you have to have a landscape that you can use it. But human need for beauty and order is how we create a little bit of order in these wildscapes. The easiest way to make a little bit of order in your wildscape is to create a line in some way. This is a wall that has created a little line and, and I know that um, it can be curved, it can be straight. A, a dry riverbed or a walkway is a line that you can use in your landscape. Using a row of plants can be a line. And I moved to this fairly quick because I wanted to show you that this has a line, a curvy line, and I, li I have a tendency to use broader curves than that because I want every curve apex to apex is a view. And, and so this has lots of curves and I didn't do that part, I did this landscape, but I didn't do that part and it drove me nuts. It was like, okay, I got all these little things, what am I gonna do to make, make that view a broad view? I want people to see the whole landscape. So, repetition. I put the same plant over and over again so it took your eye across that and took you away from those curves. Um, we use color in the landscape, uh, some kind of a bright thing will um, uh, makes it interesting. People love color in landscape. Texture. Texture is really your friend because when, when the plant stops blooming, you have this texture. This is a ground cover. This is a, a, the texture of a grass. Um, this um, perennial has a different texture. All of those textures make that interesting. One of the things that makes this, and it can be, it can be interesting, but it also can be lean over into that messy look. So you have to be careful and, and, and have big areas of a certain texture so that that works. And speaking of that, mass and scale is another technique is, this is very striking. You have nine yuccas in this picture and odd numbers are more interesting than, than um, even numbers. I have no idea why, that's just a reality. They are more interesting. But again, this mass, this is an alley that makes that look very neat. And um, there is a, a the other side to this is when you use masses of plants, you have lost that diversity. If you have a big enough space, this is on um, a university campus. We had lots of space. There's lots of space there. And so there's a lot of diversity because there's a big area. And so um, just keep that in mind. The more mass you use, the less diversity ha you have. And so if you have a small yard, you may not want to use a big, big area like this. You may want just one or, one or three yuccas instead. Um, accents, a plant, this is a red bud, 
or even just a bench can be your accent to give that sense of order in that landscape. Now this is um, a Molly Holler wildscape and it's in a park. But I wanted to, I just had this picture and I just wanted to point out some of the things that have been used in this to create the order. Look at this. These are fall asters. Repetition, repeated along that area. Look at the line of the fence. Those are the things, parks, parks are traditionally people want grass, you know, they want that turf in parks. And so the, even though this wasn't approved in this park area, they still had to use these same techniques to make them attractive to land, to um, um, homeowners. So in your own yard, you may have, this is, a, this is a before picture, you may have erosion, you may have shade, here's a shade area, so this is gonna be your woodland landscape, this is the sun area, this is gonna be your, your uh, prairie landscape, so prairie, woodland, and that's your landscapes. Um, this was a lot to cover in a small time, but the NLCP program has um, a design level two, is, and I think Houston is, has two level two classes coming up in November that are still have room. Um, you, you're gonna learn a whole lot of these same things. Um, level one is, um, uh, required for that, but level one gives you those basic ecoregions. If you need to learn that first and where they're at and what they are, that's the one you want to take. Um, and then come back and take level two. So um, thank you. Um,